I have no expectations of anything anymore. I do not know how to set targets for anything anymore. For all the information that you have, you have to just kind of look at it and say, is this even valid anymore? This is a very scary thing for me. From Amaya Media, I'm Chirag Desai. Welcome to a new season of Tales of the Trade, a show about our local entrepreneurs and pioneers, and the stories not just behind their companies, but also the communities they brought to life. Now, it's been quite the six months since our last season, which we had cut short in March due to the advent of the novel coronavirus. And unlike anything before it, at least in our lifetimes, the pandemic forced us to navigate some tough decisions of having to pit safety of our customers, partners, teams, and the economy, the businesses, and the general uncertainty all against one another. And as we ourselves grappled with some of this, I started having more and more conversations with friends, some of our partners, and a lot of entrepreneurs on how they've been coping. And so on this season of Tales of the Trade, we'll be talking to some previous and new guests and some partners on how they've been working through what is arguably one of the toughest years of our lifetimes. Now, you might remember Frying Pan Adventures from season one. They were Dubai's first food tour company, helping their customers, both tourists and residents, visit the unknown roads of old Dubai and discover the various subcultures through food. And for a company whose entire business model was based on their customers physically visiting these spaces, it should come as no surprise that they were quite adversely impacted as Dubai neared full lockdown in March 2020. It happened in stages, Chirag. There was the pre-lockdown. Some people were getting anxious. Some people just called it being paranoid and... I was in the stage where I was definitely getting anxious and I was afraid of judgment about being paranoid. So that that was the dichotomy that was happening at that time. But I remember our guides talking about this, especially the ones that had to go into the busy souk area, voicing whether they should be wearing masks. And this was way before the lockdown. This was way before they said masks were mandatory. All that happened much later. And honestly, I couldn't get my head around the fact that how would you give a tour with a mask on? And so I was a little bit in denial phase for some time. I really felt like we would know if we were not supposed to do the tours. I was really waiting for a directive. Everybody else was doing tours. It felt okay. But then what happened was the cases started to skyrocket in Iran. And that's when it suddenly struck home. That made me really nervous because the spy souk, it just... The proximity of the country made me really nervous to enter in places in in the souk. And I remember we pulled our souk store. We got questions from people. Why are you doing this? There's no restriction. Why are you stopping? I just did not feel comfortable. I didn't feel comfortable for my guests. I didn't feel comfortable for my guides. If I wasn't comfortable going in there and doing the tours, who was I to send someone else? And we were still offering our other tours. But then it just got to a point where I think the anxiety level, personally, for me, just based on the news I was seeing, I I realized I didn't want to wait for a directive. And if I couldn't assure the safety of my guests, because there was too much we did not know. It was just the, the cases were rising around the world. And it was a thing that it was sort of like, we have to take this action now. We don't feel comfortable. I can't sleep every night knowing that something could happen. And it was interesting because I know we got a lot of customers reaching out to us saying, "What are you? why are you guys doing this? This is not such a big deal. Or do you really think it's that serious? Or we actually had someone who got really upset. They're like, but you advertised this tour. This is so irresponsible. Now you're pulling it two days before it's actually going to happen. And I just had to explain that, look, I... You know, for us, safety is more important than the revenue. We're going to return your money. And it's this is not about money for us right now. It's just the simple fact that if something happens tomorrow, that that tour is not going to be that important in the grand scheme of things. What was it for you like after that? So you've done that and you're sort of sitting and reflecting now. And suddenly you're realizing, wait a minute, what kind of impact is this actually going to have on my business tomorrow? And, and because we still don't know. First, it was the feeling of just relief. Second, it was just me sitting down and calming down and just 
relaxing. Like I, I, I didn't, uh, I, I was not getting harrowed about, oh my God, tours have stopped. That, that, that did not hit. Honestly, the world had paused. It had become just a little bit quieter. And I, I think I needed that peace of mind. Uh, I wish this was not the reason why I had got it, but it was good to get that peace of mind because then it helped me think about what the next steps were. And a lot of them were financial after that, you know, cutting whatever we thought we could in order to help our team kind of get through it in the longer run. The point was this happened in March. This is right in our peak season. Yeah. Okay, it, this is not something where you say we have cases rising around the world and in two weeks we're going to be fine. Part of me wanted to believe that, but honestly, that was not going to happen. So, okay, if it's going to take two months, then we're going to enter summer and summer is a dead time for us anyway. It's when we get nothing. You started out by communicating back to the community about how they could support you potentially. Yeah. Uh, since then, you've also come out with very more specific things. So talk to me through some of those decisions and, and how you got there. All of those actually happened much later. I feel like the period before that felt like forever yeah. uh, where we just did nothing. Like we literally just did nothing other than refunding and refunding and refunding. And that was our life for a long time for a long time. I also remember us just having conversations as a team, the team just getting on a Zoom call, our first call and just venting. We just allowed everyone to just kind of get whatever they were feeling off their off their hearts. And I think that a lot of the team was already moving ahead in that they were thinking about virtual experiences. Why don't we do this? Why don't they were in problem solving stage? I was not there yet because in my mind, I thought, does it make sense to just rethink our entire business model? That is costly to do that, you know, to just pivot, as people call it, that word pivot. Or should we just wait it out? And a big part of me was like, no, 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 let's just wait this out. I don't see us. How, how do you do a virtual food tour, honestly? Like how, what, what do I like hold a burger up at your face? I mean, not like we don't serve burgers, a shawarma up at your face. Right. So the point is that, I just, it took us a very, very long time, I think, to actually react. And what prompted me to just say, okay, no, I actually need to start believing in the things that the team is is suggesting. So I was in that denial phase, was I was starting to see initiatives from around the world. Food tour companies in the US were doing these like tour in a box, you know, virtual happy hours. Until I saw them working, I did not really buy into them. So the first initiative that was born out of that, our first virtual program was called Hug in a Box. And that was a combination of us seeing what people around the world were doing. But also in our own backyard, we were seeing one of our favorite Persian vendors. His shop was really suffering. They needed a boost. They didn't have an online platform. And it just felt like the perfect combination of saying, look, we will bring your shop online. We'll bring it online in a curated way, which is how we typically interact with guests. We we don't give them a menu and say, choose. We give you a curated experience. So we'll give you a bunch of themed curated boxes. They will be delivered home. We'll handle all of the ordering, all of that, because we already have an online platform where people book tours. But we're not doing it for any profit of our own. We were doing it purely to support uh, to support a local vendor. So partly, I think it was, as you mentioned, it was you were not sure if these ideas would work and then, you know, what's the point of investing in them if they don't? But do you think partly it was also kind of, you knew that if you had to start confronting or you had to start dealing with this, it meant you had to start like looking at your business inside out to understand. Yes. And I think almost every entrepreneur would have to, have to go through it is to evaluate your business and say, can my business survive in an era where this is just a reality one? And then can it sustain itself in, in this kind of adjusted reality? I think so. It was a, it was a question of if I'm really going to start considering these alternatives, then actually the question I want to ask is, do I want to be in this business to begin with? Because honestly, the margins on a footer business are not that high. We work incredibly hard. I've worked in other industries before that are much higher in terms of the the return that they generate. And sometimes it has been honestly quite frustrating because for the amount of work that we put in, uh, a regular food tour business does not yield that level of return. So can you imagine what a virtual food tour business will yield? It's, it's not enough. It's not enough to sustain you for the long 
run. It's not enough to pay you back for the amount of effort that you're going to put in. And at some point you question yourself for all of that effort. Why don't I just do something totally different? So, and honestly, that is the place I am at even now where I'm asking myself, are we in the right business given this, this new environment? Are we in the right business? We have, I think the right team. That's not the question. The question is just, is this something that will work going forward? And that's something I ask myself every day. I haven't figured it out. You mentioned the hug in the box as being your first initiative. Um, what was the, the outcome of that like? So it was incredibly successful when we launched it. I remember we launched it on a Friday afternoon, which is usually for, for us from a social media standpoint, it's kind of dead. Yeah. Our goal was not necessarily that you have to buy a hug in a box. We wanted to shine a light on a small local vendor for you to reach out to him if you wanted to buy anything and he would have it delivered to you. We wanted you to know about him. And I think that was achieved incredibly well. We provided that support to a vendor at the time that he needed it most. Now the economy has opened back up. He's also built some new relationships with people. They themselves have an online delivery platform. This gave him a lot of confidence, actually, to sell stuff online and to figure out that model. So we were successful in our in what we had set out to do. But would that virtual hug in a box be a sustainable product for us going forward? Absolutely not. No, and I think it's a combination of what you were just describing. I think there was, uh, among the community, there is a, there is an element of saying, look, we also know that there are a lot of people who are who have had to take hits because of what's happening around the world. I, I need someone to enable it because I can't go around doing that. But but if someone can enable it, I'm more than happy to contribute. So that's kind of what the sentiment is. Yeah, I think you've, you've said it perfectly well because for the hug in a box, we actually got people from even outside of Dubai reaching out, outside of the country reaching out saying, this is a really fantastic idea, but we don't live there. And if we could gift it to someone who actually needs it, that would be amazing. If you are able to set that up, we will contribute. So that basically gave us the seed for the the next initiative, which was the Gift a Meal. The Gift a Meal program they launched resulted in distributing nearly 4,000 meals over 97 days that the program ran. And this summed up to just under 100,000 dirhams that were donated by the community, or $27,000 in total. Now, earlier in July, Courtney Brandt, who hosts another show on our network called CSR of One, spoke to Farida Ahmed, so you can find a link in our show notes to that interview, which has more details about how the program worked. While the benefit of providing meals to those who couldn't afford it at a time like this was indeed invaluable, what the program actually did was also support the local restaurants that are so integral to the culture of Zubai, and to Frank Penn's own ecosystem. We felt really responsible. These are people that have supported us and we have supported them for many years. They're like our family, our extended family. And so I would constantly be hearing things either directly from the restaurants or from guides or other part, other members on the team who were in touch with these restaurants And every time I would hear this negative situation of no one's coming to the restaurant, we don't know how we're going to cope. I just felt really responsible that we were you know, we had a platform and we had to do something, but we weren't doing anything and that didn't feel right. So that's really how uh, the gift of meal program started because we thought, look, there's people right now who who need food and there's restaurants who can cook the food, but they don't have the opportunity to cook that food. And then there's people who have the income. And so we can place the orders at the restaurants on behalf of whoever wants to give a meal from whichever part of the world, actually, that they want. If someone is sitting in Peru and they want to gift a meal, that's fine. Uh, we will gift that meal from the restaurant and that gives the restaurant some business. Uh, and that meal will get delivered to somebody who actually needs it. And it it works in many ways because not only does it feed people who have lost their income, not only does it give the restaurant business, but remember it also keeps, it contributes to keeping a restaurant team engaged and employed, which is important. From a community perspective, there's no doubt this is, has this impact. I think it will continue to have impact, but it's not a business line for you, right? No. As an entrepreneur, and I know you said you were still kind of figuring this out, but where do you go from here? So you're right. The Gift a Meal program is purely a community initiative. And 
we're not making anything out of that. We are right now at the place where as a team, we're assessing the protocols that would be needed to be in place, the health protocols, sanitization, social distancing, all of those protocols to actually make our tours work. But a part of me, and this is not a part that I necessarily am engaging the rest of the team on, is actually thinking, are we just in the right business? And I don't have the answer figured out to that. I'll give you a very simple example. I signed up to get over my own skepticism of online experiences. I signed up for an online tour academy okay. saying, I'm going to train myself on how to do this. Okay. And to get over that cynical attitude I have, like, why will someone take an online tour and so on and so forth. Then the restrictions lifted and suddenly people didn't want to be in front of a computer anymore. Yeah. There's a lot of fatigue, actually. Yeah. So people didn't want to be in front of a computer anymore. And then I'm thinking, should I be sitting here trying to make an online experience work in an environment where that market is so cluttered and I'm really going to have to push the marketing of that product? Or should I use this time to just think about really are we in the right business and do we need to just completely shift business lines because really what what do we do we are people who are really passionate about food we are great researchers we are great storytellers is the only thing we can do food tours no and so the question is what are the kinds of content can we put out there that can be monetized and so the way i think about it is more in terms of a content company rather than a food tour company which is something that we should have honestly been thinking about long ago. This is not just about uh, COVID. COVID. COVID puts the pressure on us. But if we want to increase returns as, as a company and, 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 and just reward our team better, I think that's something we needed to do a long time ago. Interestingly enough, this is something I heard so much from entrepreneurs over the last few months. What the lockdowns definitely did was made us all evaluate how we're running our businesses. But aside of resulting in something new... All these shifts to digital or look at alternative means of connecting with our consumers or our larger audience was actually an acceleration of things we should have done months ago, if not years ago. And now we were left with no choice. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Tales of the Trade from Amaya Media. Hi, I'm Courtney Brandt, and I'm happy to share the third season of CSR One, a podcast and social initiative, is now live. Each week, we'll be talking to individuals who are putting their weight behind philanthropic initiatives outside their chosen careers. From responding to the demands of the community during COVID-19 to realizing a sustainable dream, our guests are truly inspiring. You can find the third season of CSR of One in your favorite podcast players, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and even streaming apps like Spotify and Angami. We can't wait to share these inspirational conversations with you and hear your feedback. Welcome back. I'm Chirag and you're listening to an all new season of Tales of the Trade with Arva Emmet today from Frying Pan Adventures. And one of the things the pandemic has definitely impacted is our mental health as well. Working in non-centered environments, not able to see our loved ones or even our colleagues and friends. It's made it hard for everybody, entrepreneurs or not. And for me too, there were definitely days where it was really difficult to stay motivated all through the day. I think it's um I think it's a day-to-day sort of answer, to be honest. Right now, I am uh, I am pretty confused. Like, I've had moments where I feel like, uh, you know, I, I feel, yes, we can do this and let's hold the torch and move forward. And, you know, it's, it's going to be like, we're going to figure this whole thing out. But actually, I think most of the days I'm just like, oh, crap, I have no clue. And... I don't know what the next few months are going to look like. One thing I do know is uh, I have a really fantastic team and I don't want to lose them. Uh, But unfortunately, especially for our extended freelancers, I've not been able to support them at all right now, which really sucks. So I don't know. I am asking myself the same set of questions every single day. Maybe I need to have a team of advisors. I think part of the reason why I don't have a team of advisors outside of frying pan is just because maybe I'm afraid. I heard this on a podcast, another podcast, actually, who run the world, actually, that podcast is. And I was listening to this uh, lady 
talk about why she was afraid, I think, of having like a board of advisors. And it was because she's like, they're going to challenge me, you know, they're going to ask all the questions that I don't want to answer. And they're going to make me do things that I don't want to do, which is probably all of the things that I need to be doing right now. So I think maybe that's the answer, because I really am in a stage where I'm so confused. And I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is, because every every tour company is doing a different thing. And my team is like, oh, we should come out with a recipe book and we should do like a we should do virtual driving tours and we should do this and that. And part of me is just like, oh my God, that's so much work. And who's going to pay for that? Do you think part of that is, um, so you don't really have a, a model to look at, right? So, I mean, you mentioned just now as well, like oh, some companies in the US have done X or Y, but we don't know if that applies here that easily and stuff. And, you know, some of your skepticism was warranted, some of it isn't, and we don't know that yet. Um, do you think that has a lot to do with it, that you're not able to visualize where something might work and where something might not here? I'm not sure it's for lack of a model to follow because we're not followers. That's what we're not. I mean, the reason we're doing what we're doing is because no one else was doing it. And that's what gives us excitement. In fact, there are other, you know, they, they have these large multi, uh, like multinational virtual tour companies that hire local guides and places. And I've seen the local guides offering virtual tours and I still was like, uh, I don't know about this. So I don't, I don't think it's that. I just think that the world is changing so much. You had mentioned earlier, you know, what, what were your expectations like, for example, of selling the gifted meals. I had no expectations. I have no expectations of anything anymore. I do not know how to set targets for anything anymore because I do not understand Exactly. I don't even understand who our target market is right now. This is a very scary thing for me because our our target market is definitely not the same as it was a couple of months ago. Everyone in our target market is kind of fractured now because everyone has a different level of appetite for risk. Everyone is looking at the situation completely differently. Some people are ready to travel, some people are not. So you can't you can't look at things in the same way as you did before. All the information that you have, you have to just kind of look at it and say, is this even valid anymore? And for me, that is a very scary thing because I just, I do not understand the market. So everything that we do is like a little experiment. You just kind of put it out there and see, is it going to work or is it not? And the question is, is something not working because you're not pushing it enough? Or is something not working because it is fundamentally not the right product? And no matter how much you push it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna sell. So I'm really in that place where I don't, I don't know necessarily what to do next. We are doing a lot of little mini experiments and we're constantly thinking of other things that we can possibly do to supplement our income. But if I said that I figured it out, I mean, that would be a big lie because I definitely have not. I mean, if you look online today, like at all the reactions that come out when when something new is announced or when something changes and you just realize that everybody is going through so much mentally. Yes. They're all our consumers and our customers, right, at the end of the day. And so if they're going through that levels of confusion and it, it's very difficult to be able to even, uh, like you said, it's very difficult to adequately uh, predict what's going to happen next. Absolutely. I mean, uh, like a really simple example is when we launched Virtual Spingo, which is our online spicy bingo we thought, yes, this is the right product for children. Okay. And we're going to have a children's version of this and every mom is going to want this and boom, the restrictions lifted. And suddenly all the parents were like, uh, the last thing we want is our kids in front of a screen. So we're thinking, Hmm. Okay. So now suddenly this product is not going to be so, so suited to children what we actually found out from one of the games that we hosted was that the market over 70, which is still a market that is not necessarily eager to step out anywhere yet, they're the perfect market for this because they are still at home. They're still looking for ways to connect with people. Uh, they love this idea of getting online, connecting over a game that's sort of fun and semi-intellectual. And you have this quirky game master with like weird things happening in the back. I mean, they totally dig it. And I had never thought of that as a market. I was going to say, by the way, on a, on a side note, like, so for my parents, like, it's, 
they're, they're having weekly bingo nights. Like it is, it is a thing. Yeah. If it, if it's a, a day and um, you know, and and it's kind of like, hey, like you're, we're going to be busy from X to Y because we've got our bingo night, right? So just don't 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 bother <laughs> us, right? And so it, it is, it's definitely something something worth looking into. And I'm sure they're they're they would be interested in uh, the spice element of it too, right? Uh, yeah. Just knowing knowing. Could, could you have anyway. predicted that? Like, could you have? I I, yeah. I would never have sat there and been like, okay, this is what's going to happen. I need to have a product. It was only because we put a product out there and then we realized, oh, whoa, okay, so this is how it... So had we not even taken on that experiment, we would never have known. I had been so conservative about taking money out of frying pan. But now this is my life savings, you know, that's in frying pan. Yeah. And it's like, you just watch it every month go like... Bye bye. I, I feel so helpless because how many things can you do? Like, okay, the they people say now's the time. Like, get on your social media and da da. Okay, so you're talking about Instagram feeds, story, IGTV, like um, Insta Live. Then get your Facebook. Then get your Facebook strategy right. Okay, be on LinkedIn also and YouTube. And I'm just how? Yeah, but somebody has to how? fund that, right? Like, it's not. It's, it doesn't happen for free, by the way, right? So. No. Yeah, oh, no. it's one thing to say like, okay, I'm going to start producing IGTV videos. Well, there's a huge cost to me to produce a well done IGTV video. Yeah. But then it's going to, it's going to take me, wait, how many, six months before I get a following? In a way, I don't blame people like throwing suggestions at you or, or at us because it's kind of like, okay, why don't you try X or Y or Z? But yeah. when you're trying to think about this from a business, every decision is like, well, do I? Because I'll put some money in now, but then what happens after that? Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, the podcast at least has given us something to hang on to. Like it's been the only thing, even though it doesn't generate anything for us, it's been at least a level of encouragement because the whole team kind of gets involved in doing it. Yeah. And it's a piece of out, like at least you feel like you're accomplishing something, even if it's not earning something, okay, something real that is being accomplished. And, you know, occasionally you'll get a message from someone saying, oh, I heard this and this was really interesting or whatever else. So from that standpoint, at least it's something. And I think if we want to go down the content route, then we definitely need this. But yeah, I'm, I'm literally uh, thinking of going backwards in the sense of like going back into the blogging, not blogging, but like going back down that route. The writing, storytelling. Where, you know, all the things that we were not so comfortable doing, like, oh, brand is reaching out to support them. But now if I need to pay bills, I need to do yeah, that yeah, shit, man. Yeah. I don't, I can't say no to that because I have a team that I need to support. As the lockdowns ease up, Frying Pan Adventures began with a couple of private tours and now have a full schedule of tours available through the end of the year. There's a link to their website, their podcast, now fittingly renamed Deep Fried, and ways to reach them in our episode's show notes. If someone out there has some genius idea for <laughs> what we should do with this kind of, you're like, oh, I need to be on her non-existent board of advisors and help this flailing whale of a person get through it <laughs> then i'm all yours yeah and hey thank you for joining us on tales of the trade again i'm chuck desai with support from abhishek mankara subramanian and Anna bojaini original music for this show was composed by reiner erlings tales of the trade is part of the amaya media network you can find out more at amaya.media and we'll be back again in two weeks <laughs>